John chapter number 1 and verse 1. The scripture says, in the beginning was the word, the word translated word here, Greek word is lagos. We've got another one it's called, in other words, rhema. And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, now watch carefully, the connection with life and light. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name we pray. Amen. I had a uh, brother send me an email a little while ago. He'd listened to the message this past Sunday when I talked about Sunday morning, if you remember. I talked about the, the uh, glory of God. The light literally wrapped itself around this virgin daughter of Zion. And that light was Christ coming down into the womb of the woman. And she was impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible said he had to overshadow her because she could not bear the full force of the glory of God coming down upon her. So Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you. And the Holy Spirit did overshadow her. And then we went to Hebrews chapter number one and showed you how that from the invisible God that dwells where no eye has ever seen, a light shone down into this world. That light that came down into this world was the very manifestation of the glory of God and it was from the very person of God. In other words, the essence of God. The light was coming down from the essence of God and it was the very image of that eternal being. The Lord Jesus Christ restored the image that Adam lost from the time that Adam sinned in the garden until the time Christ showed up. Men had a aborted image or they had a they had an image that was tainted. It was not the full glory that God had made Adam because when God made Adam, he didn't have any clothes on. He had glory covering him. And then when he sinned against God, the glory left and he realized he was naked. Then he tried to cover himself with fig leaves. The glory of God and the light of God are, are some remarkable things because I'm going to go a little further in it with you tonight. I'm going to talk about over there in 2 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul said that we behold the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and in beholding that face, we're looking into the very glory of God. The light of God. The 12th day of this month until the 20th day of this month, December the 12th through December the 20th, is Hanukkah. That's a Jewish feast day, the Feast of Lights, they call it, that goes back to the time where we talk about between the Testaments, between the time of Malachi and the time of Matthew, between the Testaments, and you read about this in the Apocrypha, the book of Maccabees especially, is a historic first and second Maccabees. It talks about Antiochus Epiphanes, a Syrian, who came down and killed a swine on the altar in the temple and desecrated it. And when he did it, of course, he had desecrated the building and enraged the Jews. They eventually drove them out and they wanted to rededicate the temple. And in order to rededicate the temple, they needed to light the menorah. They needed the oil to light the menorah, and they only had one night's or one day's worth of oil. So they prayed, and God allowed that one day's worth of oil to burn for eight days. Thus we have eight candles on the menorah with a center candle, which is the shamash. Now, from the 12th of December till the 20th of December, the Jews observed Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights. And the way they would do that is to take the shamash, which is the center most of the time, candle, and then they'd put one candle on the right-hand side. They'd take the center candle, and they'd light that candle. They would never take any of the candles and light another candle with it, only the shamash could light the candle. So the first night they would take the shamash, 
and they would light the first candle, then put the shamash back in its place. That would be the first night. The second night, they would put two candles. Then they would take the shamash, light it first, and then from left to right, they would light the second candle, then the first candle, and then put the shamash back in its place. They would repeat this over a period of eight days, and in the process, they would be praying prayers, singing psalms, and worshiping God. The shamash means the servant of the Lord. It's a remarkable thing that the shamash, which is the servant of the Lord, is a light. Now, the Jews don't accept our Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah, but he is the light of the world, and he is the servant of the Lord. And whether they realize it or not, all the other lights can only be lit by that center light, the shamash. So the light comes from the shamash and lights all the rest of them. And the light can only come into this world from the shamash, the servant of the Lord, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, who will lighten the soul and the heart of a man. He's the only light there is. He's the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into this world. John chapter number 1. The enemy of God, the devil, blinds the minds of men and puts them into darkness. Instead of light and illuminating them, he puts them into darkness, outer darkness, eventually. And this gives you the corresponding counterpart to the truth and to the light. Now in the Old Testament, when Solomon built the temple, the Bible said the glory of God came into that temple. And the glory of God came into that temple and it was so powerful that the priest had to leave the temple. So beautiful and so wonderful. It drove them out, which is a good thing because it reinforces the idea that you can't stand before the glory of God. Remember when Moses wanted to see his glory, the Lord said, I know you mean well, Moses, but you're not going to be able to handle that yet. So he put him in the cleft of the rock and he passed by and said, talked about the goodness of God. So the glory of God was in the original temple of Solomon. And you know the glory of God followed the children of Israel when they came out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage. And the glory of God was a cloud that, that abode upon the top of the tabernacle. And to the children of Israel, that cloud illuminated their paths and gave them light. But to the enemy, it gave them darkness. It served a twofold purpose. It's like a two-edged sword. It's on one hand, it gives truth. But on the other hand, it cuts. So this light of God, the glory of God, gives light as in the case of Mary when she bore the Lord Jesus Christ and brought him into the world. The wise men from the east came and they followed his star that Balaam prophesied of in the book of Numbers. And they followed that star and it came and stood over where the young child was. Don't you think it's remarkable that none of Herod's men could see that star? And Herod could not see that star? It was darkness to them. In other words, they didn't see anything. But those that were, that, those that were called, the chosen, the ones that God had, uh, had illumined their soul, they followed that light, and the light will always bring you to Christ because he's the only light there is. But it brought them to Christ. So when that temple was built in the Old Testament, Solomon built the temple. Of course, he didn't do it with his hand, but he was the one who David gave him the plans, and he, uh, and he, and he was in league with Hiram, the, the king of uh, Lebanon, of the north, and Tyre. And they built the temple, and when they built the temple, the glory of God came into that temple. And it stayed there until they apostatized and turned their back on God. And it's one of the saddest scenes that you'll read about in the Old Testament. Because what you read in the Old Testament is how that the glory of God departed from the temple. But the glory of God did not depart from the temple in one single motion. He came out and he paused. Then he went to the top of the Kidron Valley and he looked back <laughs> and he paused again. He was reluctant to leave, but he had to leave. And then he left by the way of the east. When the Lord Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, he said, your house is left unto you void, talking about the temple of God. So the glory had departed. The glory wasn't there. But when the Lord Jesus Christ walked into that house, he brought the glory of God with him. For the apostle John says in John chapter number 1, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, how you define that glory and how it appears to someone is another matter altogether. 
But tonight I want to call your attention to a few scriptures in the New Testament that relate to Christ as the glory of God. And he is. He is the manifest glory of God. Amen. In other words, he's the beautiful one. He's the altogether lovely one. He's the rose of Sharon. <laughs> he's the son of righteousness that shall arise with healing in his wings. Malachi. Now go over there and look at that text. Malachi chapter number, uh, uh, let's try four, verse two. Last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter number four and verse two. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now how many in your Bible notice how son is spelled and is capitalized? How's it spelled? That's not a personal pronoun. <laughs> that is an object in the sky. S-U-N is not the way you spell son if he's a son of a, of a father. You spell that S-O-N. So what you've got here is a reference to the sun shining in the heavens, but it is also has a double application because it's referring to Christ who is the son of righteousness that shall arise with healing in his wings. Now, he's called in the book of Revelation, the bright and morning star. Therefore, there's a, here's, a, here's a clear reference in the Bible to the Lord Jesus Christ being one who rises up in due time, and when he rises up, the sun begins to shine. And it did. Because when Simeon held this little baby in his hands, he said, he will be a light to the Gentiles. And I told you last Sunday how that the last thing in the mind of a Jew was the fact that a Gentile, goyim dog, could have any light. But when Christ came into this world, he came into this world not to die just for a Jew. He came to this world to die for Gentiles. Red men, yellow men, black men, white men, pink, blue, gray, green, whatever. He came to die for all mankind. For by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. Go back to John chapter number one. I hate to beat up on Paul Calvin. <laughs> but look at verse number nine, John chapter number one. That was the true light which lighteth the elect that cometh into the world. Not what it says, is it? What's it say? Every man. Every man. Every man. Now, some of the translators that uh, like to play with Greek, they like to spin this and they like to make it say this. Here's the way they'll read it. Verse number nine. And coming into the world, he is the true light. What have I done to the meaning? I've completely changed it. But you would, you would be surprised at how many commentaries say that. And why do they say that? Because the text is very clear that the light of the Lord Jesus Christ is for every last one of Adam's race. See? Yes, he is. So he's the light. And he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, in John... In, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the second Corinthians chapter number four, get that in one hand and John eight, 12 in the other. John chapter number eight and verse number 12. Look at this. Then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Isn't that remarkable? He said, I'm the light of the world. This is one of these I am statements in the Gospel of John, which is full of them. The I am statement in John is an emphatic. It's just like the book of Exodus where he says, when Moses said, what is your name? What, come on, I'm gonna, what am I going to tell them? He said, you tell them that I am hath sent you. In Greek, it is ego imi. It is I am that I am that I am that I am. I am. And when he said to the Jews, before Abraham was, I what? 
And a man say one time, that's bad grammar. He should have said before Abraham was, I was. But you see, was means that there was a point in time. I am is encompassing past, present, and future. <laughs> I am the Alpha and the Omega. The bright and morning star. Same man wrote that that wrote the Gospel of John. And wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, don't you go to 2nd Corinthians with me. Chapter number 4. And verse number 5. Well, let's just start with verse 1 to get the context because he's comparing Christ to the one who blinds men. Therefore, seeing with this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now watch this. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now watch this. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now that's strong because there's that image coming up again. And notice how that the gospel, the saving grace of God is connected with Christ and the image of God. See what I mean? You say, preacher, what kind of a body does God have? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's his body. Because God the Father, according to the book of John chapter number four, is a pure spirit being. The theologians go back, use big words, they call it anthropomorphisms. What's that? Well, when the Bible says God's hand or God's eyes or God's ears, they're saying something that relates to a human being like you. You've got hands, you've got eyes, you've got ears, right? But in eternity past, before God was incarnate in flesh, it was the angel of the Lord that showed up in the Old Testament who was the visible manifestation of God, right? But God the Father, the essence of Hebrews chapter number 1 that this light shines down from, has no eyes, no ears, no hands like you. God the Father is a pure spirit being. But when God the Father incarnated himself in flesh, he incarnated himself in flesh as the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost make up the Godhead. And in the book of Philippians chapter number 2, the apostle argued and said, In Christ Jesus the Lord dwells the fullness of the Godhead, what? Bodily. There's the bodily, there's the body part. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, is the God-man. All right? He's the God-man, and being the God-man, he is the very image of the invisible God. See what I mean? If God has a body, and he does, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the body. Now, if there's a figure, if there's some kind of a, if there's some kind of a manifestation, we don't know it, and nobody else knows it, and nobody will know it until we see him as he is. And we lay our eyes on that invisible, pure spirit being, God the Father. And it could be that there's no way you'll be able to lay your eyes on that pure spirit being without looking through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ to see him. Can you follow me on that? No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. You can't find him, and, he'll not, and hey, he doesn't have to make himself known to you. So now look how the apostle does with this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. We preach not ourselves, verse 5, but Christ Jesus the Lord, ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. This is the creation. He's going to compare the creation with the coming of Christ. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, 
In other words, if you're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, you're looking at the very image of God. And you're looking at the essence of God made manifest in flesh. And the Lord Jesus Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The Lord Jesus Christ is God of very God. This is where our Jesus only Pentecostals have a real problem because they cannot conceive that God the Father is not part, is not Jesus only. In other words, to them it is Jesus only, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that's it. But folks, I'm going to, put a, I'm going to pose a question to you again. God cannot die. It is utterly impossible. And so the Bible says that he took flesh for the suffering of death. He was incarnate in flesh so that God-man could die. On the cross at Calvary, his body was just as dead as any body could be dead. The body died, but the son departed from the body. And the Bible says when he makes his soul an offering for sin, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God the Father is looking down upon his Son. And there when he sees his Son on the cross give to the Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, it was at that moment he breathed his last. His body was dead. It was taken and laid in a tomb. And for three days and three nights his body lay in that tomb, but his soul and his spirit went somewhere. That's Orthodox Christian belief. So he tells the Christians in the New Testament, he says, when you look into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're looking at the very glory of God. I want you to look at another text, 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with open face, in other words, not covered, open. We all with open face, Beholding as in a glass, in, in, as, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See that renewing of the image? See the creating of the image? See how the image of God through the Lord Jesus Christ now is being branded on you because that's what you see? You see how that Christ becomes everything to the believer? He's your light. He's your life. He's, he's, your, he's everything that you could possibly. He's made into us all things. Righteousness. Everything that we ever aspire to be in this world is what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is reflecting the very glory of God from our faces. Now, here's, here's, here's the comparison. is with Moses in the Old Testament. When Moses came down from the top of the mountain... The Bible said he wished not that his face was shining. He didn't know. He'd been up there around the glory, and the glory had, had touched him, and his face was glowing. And so, you know, Moses had been in glory land, <laughs> and he came down to where this bunch was, and they were down there in the darkness and the shadows. And, man, his face was, his face was shining, shining. And so they had to cover it up. And the reason they did is because it faded away, all right? What happens is that Moses had been around the glory of God and the glory of God had made an impression on his face, but it wasn't permanent. It faded away. The reason it wasn't permanent because Moses wasn't born again. Now, when you're born again, born of God, a son of God by the new birth, this glory is not temporal that fades away. This glory continues to grow. You take a saint that's 50, 60 years in the faith, has been born again for 40, 50, 60 years. If that person has really grown in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to see some of the glory of God in their face. You're going to see somebody that has power over this world. The Bible said, God did not give you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what, that's what it says in 2 Timothy. He didn't give you the spirit of fear. Satan fills you full of fear, full of doubt. He does. He wants to drive a wedge between you and God. But if that overcoming spirit, that spirit of victory, 
really begins to grow in the, in the, in the, the spirit and soul of that believer, then this reflection of Christ is going to come off of their face. Come off of their face because it's not something that's going to fade away. What we have now is going to be for eternity. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Well, I don't see his face, preacher. You see his face if you open the Bible and start reading it. Get on your face and doing some praying. You'll be amazed at how God can manifest himself to you. It's a wonderful thing if you've got the light. Now, this light that's in you is not your light. Okay? I know you've got a light and you let that light shine. But you didn't create that light. That light was put in you. That's a divine light. Yes, sir. That's the light of God. You didn't generate it. You didn't light it. It came from God. And he said, don't let your, don't cover that light up in a bushel. Cover, put, a, put something over the top. He said, let your light shine. So they say they take the Hanukkah, the Hanukkah, the Hanukkah, the menorah, during Hanukkah. And when they light these candles, they put it in the window so that people coming by can see the menorah inside the window. And the menorah is, of course, representative of the light of God that's in that home. Now, such a sad thing is that the Jew can take you so far, and then that's as far as he can go with you. It's like the, the preaching of, of, uh, of John the Baptist. John the Baptist could take you so far, but he couldn't take you all the way. It's like Moses. He could take you so far, but he couldn't take you into the land. But remember this, and don't ever forget it, folks. The roots of where you came from and your faith is not connected with anything on this earth but Judaism. Judaism. And so the next time you hear somebody running a Jew down, remember, salvation is not on Mount Gerizim, John chapter before, to the woman at the well. He said to her, salvation is of the Jews. And a lot of people hate that thought. But my friend, that's the truth. We, you, when, you, when you look at your Christian faith, you look at the roots of it, you look at the foundation of what we believe and who we are, folks, it came straight out of the Old Testament. Amen. This is why the two on the road to Emmaus, he took the Bible, he opened it up, and the Bible he took was not the New Testament, folks. It hadn't been written. There was no, no New Testament writing. He took the Bible, the, the Tanakh. They don't call it the Old Testament. That's a tacit uh, uh, approval of a New Testament or, or admission of a New Testament. The Tanakh. He took it and he opened it up and he showed them himself in that and their hearts burned within them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, what did he take? He took a Jewish Bible. And he took a Jewish Bible. He appealed to a Jewish Bible and he said to the Pharisees, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he said, he opened to them the Bible, the Word of God. And so you ought to love the Old Testament like you do the New. Amen. I, I, don't, I never call it the Old Bible. I know some folks do. But uh, I, call it, you know, I just call it the Old Testament and the New. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your presence tonight for the sweet Holy Spirit, for what you've done for us, for your goodness. And Father, once again, we pray for my brother, Tim. We ask you in Jesus' name, touch him now. In thy name we pray, amen. Brother, I thank your brother, Knapsaker, you singing tonight.